The reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts in, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They looked for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, what do we most need in a global pandemic? Uh, What do we most need when our world seems to be turning upside down? What do we need most when the future feels so uncertain in lots of ways? I think most of all, we need a big vision of God. Uh, Whether it's on the macro scale of whole nations in turmoil or the micro scale of your own life, We need a big vision of God with so many uncertainties and fears about the future. For each of us, uh, what's going to happen about my school or university course? Uh, Will I be able to get a job? Uh, Will I keep my job? Uh, Will there be a second wave of this virus? Uh, Am I still at risk? Will it ever be safe for me to go out if I've got an underlying health condition? Uh, We all have our own fears, uh, which we're real and and warranted. And in the face of them, we need a big vision of God so that we can trust him in the present and for the future. And here in our passage in Isaiah, he, he paints this wonderful picture of the majesty of God. 
It, it's a big canvas. It's a big vision of who God is, a, a God who we can trust, a God who we can rest in, a God in whom we can put our hope, a God who will keep us persevering, holding us tightly whatever lies ahead. Like when life is hard, of course, it's, it's very easy, isn't it, to, to think that either God is not there or if he is there, he doesn't really care. I, I think that was probably the situation for many of the people for whom Isaiah was first writing these words. The people of Israel were in captivity in Babylon. They'd experienced their land invaded, the city of Jerusalem destroyed, 70 years of exile and struggle. And they don't really understand what's going on, so they complain. You can see it in uh, verse 27. Uh, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Where is God, they're saying, in all this agony? It all seems so out of control. That doesn't he know what we're going through? And so Isaiah responds, just if you've got your Bible open, look at verse 28. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. We saw last week in, in verses 1 to 11, that the great message of comfort, that God himself is coming to rescue this people in exile. If you missed that, it's worth listening to an excellent talk from, from Matt Searles, who was visiting. But now here in verses 12 to 31, Isaiah wanted to give him a big vision of God to, to fill our minds, to warm our hearts. And here we see, uh, summarized in, in that verse, um, four things about God. Uh, and we see them in these verses. They come out in all these verses. Uh, firstly, we see that, that God is an everlasting God. Do you not know, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God? God. Uh, was it to be everlasting? Well, it means that God is eternal. That, that is, he never changes. He always remains the same. Uh, of course, that's impossible for us to fully comprehend, isn't it? Because uh, as human beings, we, we know, all we know is change, you know, physically, temperamentally. Uh, we're always inconsistent. We're always changing. Things change in us and, and, and the way we feel. But, but God remains the same. He is the everlasting God. Good. The same before the world was in existence. He'll be the same long after the world. Uh, as we know it has gone. He is the everlasting God. And his character will never change. Therefore, he is absolutely dependable. Nothing worse is that for, for a child, we know this in growing up, than, than going to someone who is always changing. They never know whether they're going to get a hug or a smack. Uh, it's a terrible thing for, for a child to grow up in that environment. But God, the everlasting Father, is totally dependable. He's utterly reliable. He is always the same. I love these uh, words by uh, uh, a theologian, A.W. Pink. He, he says this, he says, human nature cannot be relied upon, but God can. However unstable I may be, however fickle my friends may prove, God changes not. If he varied as we do, if he willed one thing today and another tomorrow, if he were controlled by fancy, who could confide in him? But all praise to his glorious name, he is ever the same. His purpose is fixed, his will is stable, his word is sure. Here then is a rock on which we may fix our feet, while the mighty torrent is sweeping away everything around us. The permanence of God's character guarantees the fulfillment of his promises. Well, the people of God needed to hear that there in exile. Has God forgotten us? Oh, no, of course he hasn't forgotten us. He is unchanging. He is faithful. His promises stand as they always have done. He, he doesn't forget his people, uh, even there for them, hundreds of miles from home in exile. Even for us, locked out of our church buildings, unable to gather together, not sure when that's going to happen again. God is the everlasting God. He's dependable. He knows. And we need to know that. We need to grasp the, the majesty of God. He's the everlasting God. And then he's the creator God. 
Again, verse uh, 28, he, the Lord is the everlasting God, the, the creator of the ends of the earth. Now, the Bible teaches us that out of nothing, God created all that we see around us. It doesn't say definitively how. It's not a science textbook. It says, though, that God is the creator God who speaks the world into existence. And here Isaiah makes three points about that world in verses 12 to 17. So let's having a look at those verses. Uh, he talks firstly about God's power in creation in verse 12. Uh, he uses these wonderful pictures. Uh, I, I don't know, if you just cup your hand in front of you, have a look. Uh, how much water could you get in there? Maybe three or four teaspoons. God holds the oceans in the palm of his hands. Uh, stretch out your hand. How wide is it? What's the span of your hand? I, I measured mine actually this week, eight inches. I'm not going to have a very big hand. You maybe got a very big hand, well, sort of plate sized hands. Uh, you got to, you'd be brilliant at bowling, or, uh, but anyway, maybe 10 inches, 11 maybe. God measures the whole sky in the span of his hand. Uh, go shopping down a same because I see people walking along uh, uh, with their shopping bags with full of, of stuff. How much soil could you get in a, in a shopping bar, bag? Well, maybe a couple of spadefuls, a few more. God fits all the soil of the whole earth, he says, the dust of the earth in his shopping basket. Uh, kitchen scales, you had them out recently doing some baking. I know, as I, you bake. Uh, capable of weighing out a kilo or two of, of flour. Uh, God weighs the mountains and the hills on his scales. Land, sea, sky. This is the power, all created by God's power. We see the power of the created God here. Isaiah wants to see it, us to see that. And then we see God's wisdom in verses 13, 14. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Uh, God didn't call a committee together. He didn't need anyone else to help him in creation. Uh, Isaiah here is actually having a, a bit of a dig at the Babylonian uh, God Marduk, who the people uh, were being tempted to trust in instead of the real God. And, and, and Marduk in Babylonian mythology was the creator. And he had to consult with another God, Ea, the all-wise, uh, before he created. Well, Isaiah contrasts him with, a, with the true God, who, who is all-wise. You need to consult no one when he creates. He's the creator God, his, his power, his, his wisdom, according to Isaiah. Uh, and now we see in verses 15 to 17, God's independence. That is, he creates and he's not dependent upon his creation. You know, the nations of the world with all their wealth and impressive and power and achievements uh, don't impress with God one little bit. You know, we're made to worship him, but he's not dependent upon human worship, not like idols who you have to put little bits of food out for. God doesn't depend upon us. We're not doing God a favor when we look in his direction. At verse 16, Lebanon uh, was renowned for its fruitfulness, for its great cedar trees. And, and he says, even if all of those were you to make an altar fire and, and, and all the, the animals uh, sacrificed, it wouldn't impress God. He doesn't depend on our worship or on our, our sacrifices. He's the creator and we're the creatures. He's independent. Uh, we are dependent upon him. The creator God is all-powerful, all-wise, utterly independent. This is the majesty of God. And so not surprisingly, Isaiah asks a direct question to his readers, verse 18. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? And, and in those next verses in 19 and 20, they're, they're meant to be humorous. He, he's sort of mocking the idols of Babylon. He kind of speaks of the rich man's deluxe model and the poor man's economy version. And Isaiah said, are you going to compare the true God, the majesty of God, uh, with a bit of metal or wood that's going to fall over unless it's really well made? One commentator says, look, idols of the ancient world might look magnificent and mysterious. They may excite a sense of awe, but there's nothing there except the resources of the earth and human ability both provided by the Creator God. Well, the, the challenge to idolatry is important for us. Idols aren't limited to statues that may or may not stand up. Uh, idolatry is the worship of anything created in the place of the Creator. And in the 21st century, we have our own ones to, to draw us in, to take hold of our hearts, our homes, 
our wealth, our career, our popularity, uh, or reputation. There are many things, whatever it is, if it's grown too important, if it's where our security lies, if we couldn't imagine living without it, Isaiah would challenge us with that question. With whom will you compare God? God is a creator God, all-powerful and wise, utterly independent. Nothing and no one is comparable. This is the true God of Israel. This is our God. We need a big vision of God, and Isaiah is giving us one here. He's everlasting. He's the creator. This is the majesty of God. And then, thirdly, we see that he is the, the sovereign God. Verse uh, 22 uh, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. One commentator describes us human beings as squeaky little things that jump up and down. Uh, it's not a very complimentary picture perhaps of human beings, but it's not far off the truth. When we look down from a high building, uh, we often say that people look like ants scattered around. Well, imagine being able to look down on seven or eight billion people across the face of the earth, going about their daily business, scurrying here and there. Each individual would be tiny and seemingly insignificant. That is how God looks down on the world. We're so used to having a, an egocentric view of everything, as though the world revolves around us, as though we human beings are center stage and terribly important. We have such a, a human-centered view of things, but we are tiny in the relation to the world's population, tinier still in the relation to the, to the universe, and even tinier in relation to the almighty, sovereign God who rules over his creation. Oh, he's the sovereign God who, verse 23, controls history. He brings princes to naught, reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. He raises up great leaders and kingdoms. He reduces them to nothing, just as he did with the Babylonian Empire. To the people of Israel, the Babylonians must have seemed huge, invincible with their military might, their chariots and their horses, conquering Jerusalem, enslaving the people. But Isaiah tells them that even the mighty rulers of Babylon are like weak, barely rooted plants that are just blown away in the wind if God chooses to do that. The same today, although a microscopic virus has reminded us that we're not in control, we're still looking to governments and money markets and scientific research centers for solutions, for the way out. But according to verse 15, London, Washington, Beijing, uh, they're just like a drop of water in a large bucket. Powerful people, powerful organizations, uh, whole empires come and go, but God is in control. He is sustaining and ruling his creation, and he'll never tire of doing it. Of course, we'll, we'll not always understand how he's at work. Isaiah makes that clear uh, in the second part of verse 28. His understanding no one can fathom. The people of Israel didn't understand God's plan for them in captivity 70 years of course sometimes neither can we it's not till we look back and and see how God was at work that we begin to understand why things happen and perhaps even then we don't and yet God wants us to know with full assurance that he is in control that he is the sovereign God in uncertain days we we need to see the majesty of God, and we're seeing it here in Isaiah chapter 40. Everlasting creator, a sovereign who rules and reigns over all things. And then lastly and, and wonderfully, he is the compassionate God. He, he knows his creation intimately. Look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and might, mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. You know, as I say, look up and, and see those stars, billions of stars in the galaxy. 
an unknown number of galaxies. But Isaiah says, not only has God created them, not only does he lead them out so that none are ever missing, but he even calls each one by name. And if he's so intimately involved with the stars in the sky, how much more his people who he created for relationship with him. And so Isaiah immediately continues, Israel, why then do you complain that the Lord doesn't know your troubles or care if you suffer? He knows every star, forgets none of them. So he's not going to forget you. He knows what you're facing. He's aware of your challenges. He knows you intimately. And he doesn't just know us and see all that we're going through, our anxieties and concerns and pressures, but verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. This is the very nature of God, the everlasting creator who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth uh, with all power. It's not raw power because his compassion is on those who are broken and weary. And we see this compassion, of course, most clearly in the person of Jesus. It comes to fulfill these, these words. Jesus who left the glory of heaven to become like us, to sit with the broken and the sick and the outcast and the weak, who made that universal inv invitation that come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, that was the experience, too, of the Apostle Paul. Do you remember in his own suffering and brokenness when he heard God say to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, God's compassion extends to, to all. And extends to all because everyone needs that compassion. Verse 30, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Uh, the word translated used there is, is elsewhere. He used to speak of uh, those specially chosen in the military, the idea of the kind of crack troops, the SAS, if you like. Even, he says, the strongest and the fittest of God's people will get tired and worn out and will sometimes fall. And if that's you this morning... Well, that's okay, because the compassionate God knows that's going to happen times, and, and he offers strength to the weary and power to the weak. This is the majesty of God, everlasting, creator, sovereign, compassionate. He is incomparable. There is no one and nothing like him. We need this big vision of God that Isaiah paints in this wonderful chapter. And how are we to respond? Well, we get to verse 31, which I know is favourite verse for so many. That, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Or whether hearing this, these words in, in the 7th century BC in Babylonian exile or whether hearing them in the 21st century in the midst of a, a global pandemic, uh, God has given us a big vision of himself so that we might put our hope in him. That is, we might trust him with our whole lives, with our, our present and with our future, with our joys and with our fears. In every way, uh, we're called to, to, to trust, to put our hope in our majestic God. And these are great images, aren't they? Soaring on wings like eagles, marathon running, who, 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 without getting weary, a long hike and never fainting along the way. Having been watching the red kites recently circling, I think I like most I the idea of, of soaring. Uh, that will sometimes be our experience, but not always. Uh, at other times when life is closing in, when things are hard, simply keeping one foot in front of another, going in the right direction with our eyes on Jesus. That's a miracle of God's grace and strength. But that's what he promises to those who put their trust in him. As I paint a stunning 
picture, doesn't he, of the majesty of God. Read and reread these verses. And can I say, if, if you don't yet know this God, I hope that your heart might be drawn to him. And you might keep exploring uh, what it might mean for you to put your hope in him. Uh, do read on in, in the Bible or, or talk to a Christian or get in touch with us through the website. Keep coming back to the services if, if you'd like to do that. But if you're a Christian, uh, can I encourage you, whether your experience right now is soaring or, or running or just plodding and hanging on in there, uh, keep your vision big. Keep your mind expanded and your heart warmed by the majesty of God. And letting go of your idols, put your hope in him today. Let's pray together. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God, our Father, we thank you for giving us this great vision of yourself here in Isaiah chapter 40. Lord, would you continue to open our minds and hearts to you, the living God, to your majesty, that we might be able to put our whole trust in you and know the experience of your great compassion and love, filling us, strengthening us, enabling us to keep walking with you today and this week and into the future. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.